on this special edition of Inside Moore. There is a very large tornado, almost wedge, heading right towards Moore, Oklahoma. We remember the frightening day that changed our city once again. Basically told people in the building they needed to be prepared to take tornado cover. Hear chilling stories from survivors in their own words. I thought we were really gone. Everything behind us, everything in front of us is gone but us. See how our city leaders used past experiences to help citizens through their darkest hour. I can relive all of the meetings where we just all sat and just continued to ask the question, are we doing enough and what else can we do? This story is not only about the devastation. This is a story of hope, courage, and community. A community that is strong. And now part one of More Strong, the stories of May 20th. It shows that in some way we're uh, all united. We're all woven together and that we're just people. And uh, they understand and can relate to uh, the hurt that this community was feeling and it hurt them. And they wanted to do whatever it was that they could, whether it be to write a letter or to write a check or to send supplies to help in some way. They're sacred to us because it's somebody that took the time to put their thoughts on paper and get them to us. And we don't have a post office, so they really went to some great lengths to get these items to us. The Weather Service had one of their uh, briefings that morning. And it was, it's one of those days where you can kind of feel it in the air too. Um, when, when the Weather Service is telling you and also you can feel it in the air. So we knew that it was one of those days, one of those possible days. I was actually at a conference with all of the national retailers from around the U.S. and even international to the one year, one time a year that we go to recruit retail. I had sent an email to our city manager, Steve Eady, that if uh, tornadoes uh, were to hit our community on Monday, that Deidre and I would be coming back from the uh, conference. Well, I had been watching it uh, downstairs in the EOC on Galen's radars as well as on the television um, uh, weather channels, um, watching it uh, for quite a long time. While we were at the conference, it was around noon, and we saw on the television uh, the tornado coming to our community. There's a tornado appears to be on the ground looking due west. Um, we are in Moore, Oklahoma. The date is May 20th. When it first touched down, it was fairly small. <coughs> it was still a decent ways west of town, so it still had a chance that maybe it wouldn't grow very big or it wouldn't uh, continue for too long and miss, you know, maybe dissipate before town. but as it kept coming, it got bigger and bigger, and when we got to the parking lot of the Southmore High School where we filmed it from. Very large tornado entering town. This is a repeat of May 3rd, 99. This is a repeat of May 3rd, 99. Dear God, please keep these people safe. There is obvious at that point that there's no way this thing was going to die anytime soon, and the only track it was going to go on, any way it moved, um, the was, motion was possible with it, was through a very densely populated area. Basically told people in the building they needed to be prepared to take tornado cover, uh, which in this building is basically the bathrooms uh, on the first floor. We saw the debris, the debris just kind of splatted down, and and uh, came down so we knew that it was close.
we've experienced one of our most horrific storms and disasters that the state has ever faced. But yet in the midst of tragedy and loss of life, we've also seen the resilience and the courage and the strength of our people. We're talking uh, levels of debris that's four foot high as far as you can see. We're talking about cars that are upside down and, and, and school books and children's toys and, and trees without bark. Um, this was the storm of storms. This has been quite a experience. I've, I was the actual mayor here in uh, May 3rd, 1999. So this is not my first rodeo with this, but uh, it doesn't get any easier, especially with the loss of life. seen it on a map or seen it on a television screen, but then when you're driving through and you know the people that live in the homes and you know the, there's, uh, it, was, it was awful. Just a matter of minutes, things that took years to build and to grow and develop in just a matter of minutes was flattened and leveled. And so you stand there and you look at that stuff and you're just uh, amazed uh, at what has happened. You question it sometimes uh, as to you know, why, um, but but there's no answer to that question, you know. An insulation company heard it on the news. We uh, keep, the, keep the truck here in the storage bin. Got to the gate, the power had gone out. We couldn't get in the gate. The lady hollered at us. Went to put our car back. We didn't feel safe over here. She canned up in her place, me and him and the other worker here and another guy. We went into Dan McGinnis and rode it out and we heard it come over. We had no idea that it had done this. And when we come out, it, everything's gone. I mean, the whole storage place is gone. It's the craziest thing I've ever been in my life. I thought, I thought we were really gone. I thought we were done. I mean, everything behind us, everything in front of us is gone but us. We're we were just guys. we were hiding underneath the bathroom sink just as tight as we could praying God don't take us let it blow over I just I've never in my life experienced something so scary I just hope everybody else in here is okay I hope there's nobody else in these buildings because we can't we've hollered and hollered we can't hear nothing of ours, childhood friends of our son, were already over here digging for her because they knew that she was here by herself. And when we heard her barking, they, um, they just started throwing stuff, trying to get down into a hole where she was. And she was just down, tucked into this one little spot that didn't cave in. We all rushed to the boys' restroom and the girls' restroom. And then we all ducked in there. And then all of a sudden we could just hear like, it sounded like a train. My kids I knew weren't underground. So I panicked and of course it was pouring down rain. I couldn't get there fast enough. Um, but they finally got a hold of us through our cell phones. So I knew they were both okay. Um, and when I saw them, it was, <laughs> I was so thrilled to see them. I mean. 
I don't think we've ever hugged each other so tight. It was my first one, so I was pretty scared, but me and my friends started praying, and God got his hand over us, too. How did you get out? There was a hole in the wall, so we climbed through the hole in a line. The school building is about 150 yards from my house, so, but I had to go around the block, so, uh, you know, it was five minutes. By the time we got in the house, we just had a couple minutes to grab things and tried to check on my neighbor saw the tornado down the street and we got in the storm shelter with the cat and what grade is wrote it down. Third grade. My teacher, she, she slammed the door and then she came out and she said everybody get on your hands and knees and like before you know it, the door slam open back and like everything's flying and a glass hits me and I just pick it up and I start screaming and then like bam everything's on top of you. And you heard it. Y'all yeah. were singing, weren't you? You and your friend yeah. was singing, y'all locked arms and was singing the whole time. It's devastating. I've never seen anything like it. They've got cars inside the hospital. You know, I, I mean, you can see that truck sitting up there. Right. It's, it just picked them up and slung them inside the hospital. So I hope everybody over there is okay. It was really uh, quiet for a little bit before we started hearing it. It was like a, just peaceful. And then all of the sudden, we started to hear it getting rumbling closer and closer. My boys and I said a little prayer. And we asked God to keep us in his sheltering arms. And we uh, bent over and put pillows on top of us. And I told the boys I was going to cover them with my body. And we just I talked to them the whole time so they wouldn't, they would hear my voice the whole time. I told them, just don't look up, don't look up. I went through this in 2003. So 10 years ago, I went through this and lost my house totally then. So, you know, this stuff, it's stuff. It can be replaced, it's stuff. Here's the, here's the things that can't be replaced. He's Grandkids. He's 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 yeah, hi baby. More Strong, the stories of May 20th, will continue in just a moment. We at FEMA need to know who you are and where you are, if you were affected in any way by the tornadoes in Moore. You can do that by registering with FEMA. It's a first step that you have to take in order to be considered for any type of assistance. You can call 1-800-621-3362. If you're able to get online, go to www.disasterassistance.gov. If you have a smartphone, you can go to m.fema.gov. You register, it takes maybe 10 or 15 minutes when you're on the phone doing that. You provide some key information where you live, if that is your permanent residence, who lived there with you, the extent of your damage, what insurance coverage, if any, you have, and very important a means of contact. A lot of people are living temporarily with friends or family, or they found apartments, or they're, you know, they're in a hotel, but we at FEMA need to know how to contact you once you register, because the registration kicks off an inspection process. An inspector will call you back, usually in a matter of days, and make an appointment FEMA is about trying to help you get back on your feet, not making you whole again to where you were before the tornadoes occurred. And we do that through, through grants that you do not have to pay back that can be used for home repairs if a home is such that it, it can be repaired to a, to a safe, secure, and functional condition. Obviously, a lot of these homes you're going to have to start from the ground up. But we also provide housing, temporary housing assistance, and the, the main avenue of doing that is to find rental housing for people. Well, 
Well, in time of disaster, uh, since 1953, SBA has been the primary source of federal assistance for private property owners. So that means homeowners, renters, businesses of any size, as well as private nonprofit organizations. And there's three things that you need to remember. First is that it's, we're called Small Business Administration SBA, but we're not just for businesses. We want them to know that they don't have to make the decision now if they think they need or want a loan. And that's key. There are a lot of, a lot of things that they're considering right now, and they don't have to make that decision. There's no cost, there's no fees to apply to SBA. There's no points on the loan. It's simple interest. There's no prepayment penalty. And the applicants are in control. So they're going to decide if they need or want the loan. And they can tell us at that time that they're ready when they have the information to make that decision. Right now, they don't have that information. And the third thing is, as we're here, we have SBA representatives experiencing disaster applications to help each applicant complete their application. So we have customer service representatives, disaster representatives at the disaster recovery centers. The one here closest is the one at Westmore High School. And we're in partnership in there with FEMA and other federal agencies and other resources so that homeowners can come to that center and they can sit down with an SBA disaster representative and we'll help them complete their entire application. We actually have computers set up, they can actually do it online. Now, for businesses that have been impacted, we also have a business recovery center set up at Moore Norman Technology Center at the Business Development Center. And we want businesses to come there. The disaster recovery centers are kind of a one-stop shop for the residents. The businesses, the business recovery center is a one-stop shop for them. And now, part two of this special edition of Inside More. We see the overwhelming response from far and wide after the devastating tornado. A lot of press, a lot of, of calls began to be coming in from all over the, all over creation, all over the world, really. See how city officials pulled together to respond. I know that everybody's heart and minds were in the right place and how we were able to do that I have no idea. I mean, it was superhuman strength. Be encouraged by volunteers who made it their mission to help more heal. We've had over 10,000 volunteers come through these doors that are from all over the United States. And now the conclusion to More Strong, the stories of May 20th. Police and fire uh, know immediately, A, that they've got to get out there and start responding. They also know that they've got to call in everybody that, that uh, we have as far as employees. There's nothing normal about City Hall for several several weeks, maybe even several months. A lot of what your normal job is or we're normally doing with parks or this or that, that stuff's put on hold. I'm Deidre Ebrey, Director of Economic Development for the City of Moore, and I have multiple messages from multiple entities. In an emergency and in situations like this, no one really at City Hall does their jobs actually, so we all have requirements that are thrust upon us that are a lot different usually than what our jobs are. Many of our employees were affected, and when you see an employee whose house is completely gone and they show up for work the same day and they're here to answer phones and to help our citizens, there's not a whole lot more you can say. So we're doing the very best. I didn't think about the before, I didn't think about how ironic I block out everybody except um, the people who are affected. I do my best to try to think from a survivor's perspective, to try to think from those that lost everything's perspective. When the tornado on the 20th, when it occurred, while it was occurring, while it was happening, uh, 
my phone immediately began to ring. I got phone calls from CNN, Fox, from the BBC. We were receiving calls at, an, at, a, at a rate that I can't even express how many of the media were trying to call and get information from us. A lot of press, a lot of calls began to be coming in from all over the all over creation, all over the world, really. Well, thank you all for coming out this afternoon. We are trying to give daily updates on different things that are going on with the cleanup effort and the people who have been affected by these storms. I can tell you that it's a little smaller through here, and then there's about three smaller areas that are still barricaded off. And you will know that because there are officers there at checkpoints or there are barricades that you cannot get through. You have to weigh the safety of the rescuers, the safety of the citizens themselves, the safety of the people in those areas against the need and the desire by those people to get back and see what's left of their home, preserve as much as they can their their valuables, pictures, and that sort of thing, um, to be able to find uh, things that are mementos and things that are important to them. So you, there's a balance there. I can relive all of the meetings where we just all sat and just continued to ask the question, are we doing enough and what else can we do? We labored over every night that there was still a checkpoint in place and what did it mean for those citizens and if their checkpoint was there it kept them safe but then it also kept them away from their property and um, we every day every every hour we re-evaluated. The residents are able to freely come and go it's worked out really well we just uh, again ask our residents to be a little bit patient with us there are going to be temporary closures here and there for the next possibly a couple of weeks due to OG&E trying to get the power back up. Our department heads, um, most of them were here in 2003 and in 99. You just know what's going to happen, um, what by and large what the issues are going to be. Definitely those storms in the past that we've had uh, help prepare us all for, for this one. I know that everybody's heart and minds were in the right place and how we were able to do that, I have no idea. I mean, it was superhuman strength to be able to sit around the table with those leaders and come up with the ideas that we came up with and be able to execute the way that we did. I'm just so proud of the jobs that they did and each one of those department heads, yes but also all of the people that work under them. But every one of those guys and ladies had a plan and they were implementing it from day one. I think the 99 storm did it first. I think it revealed the character of more to be people that are caring, people that are very resilient, people that are concerned about their neighbors, people that are generous, people that are just outstanding people. It was just that constant feeling of hopelessness and wanting to give up and then just within a second of that feeling of despair, a call, a text, a Facebook post, a something that just said, you can do this, we're here to help, we're ready, we're, we're coming. This debris removal is a huge, huge thing and that's important to the community to get that stuff gone uh, just for the from the looks of how it looks and it looks so scarred and so bad out there now but when that debris is gone you know that'll begin to fade away and it'll be an opportunity for a lot now to be built on I put a little J here and so that way when I give it to somebody to do on the board I just put the number of the, the assistance was so overwhelming that it was it was far bigger than what we could control or what we could manage and so um, we really just had to lean on faith-based organizations and other groups to assist us with that. Serve More 
um, is just a <laughs> volunteer organization that kind of popped up on May 21st and uh, it just started with with um, me and my neighborhood just wanting to come and see how on earth we could start helping some of the folks that live here. The word got out pretty quickly and uh, we just started getting a lot of phone calls, a lot of text messages, Facebook, Twitter, um, just letting people know, hey, this is where we're at, we could use a lot more help. And as we said that, a lot more help came and uh, people started showing up kind of out of nowhere. Um, and then this amazing thing happened, we were walking down Howard Street and the guys from the, the Covenant Life Assembly came out of this gym and just said, hey, want you guys to know, it looks like you're volunteering, you're doing stuff. We've got water, we've got bathrooms. If you need anything, just let us know. And so we came in and said, well, how about letting us use your building? And they said, absolutely, we'd love to give it to the city and, uh, and just serve in any way that we can. It was Tuesday afternoon that uh, as we started working, just as this thing started to come together, Todd Jensen from, from Parks Department said, would it be possible for us to get some of your volunteers to come help with the cemetery work? So we said, yeah, let's, let's do what we can to get a couple hundred, maybe 300 volunteers if we, if we could. We said we'd shoot for 300. And uh, that morning we gathered in this gym and it, the place was packed. And it looked to us like maybe 600 people or so were packed into this gym. And then we realized outside the front doors, people were standing outside because they couldn't get in. We've had over 10,000 volunteers come through these doors that are from all over the United States that just packed up their car and brought their rakes and their shovels and their, their wheelbarrows and came on down and have just been here to help out. So you're going to be the team leader? Okay, yes. that's perfect. Okay, yes. I'm going to have you sign in. Okay. see anything like it. Hopefully I don't ever again, but I'm be willing to help. But hopefully that's the only time I'd ever see it again was maybe helping somebody else. It was so eerie that it was once populated and now it's just flat. And I'm thinking, where did they all go? Where were they when all that came through? And I was just, I can't believe all the wreckage that the wind can do. We watch the news, uh, we ask the question, what can we do? We're just here to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ and, and try to show his love to others. When there was a call, you should meet it. If you got the ability and the time and the resources, then, then meet that call. I mean, we all sit in our homes and say, well, I wish I could be. Well, forget the wish, get on your feet and get to moving. It's all worth it, yes, as we have mingled with people in the community and have just, uh, had them shake our hands and say thank you so much for coming and hopefully we're restoring some hope and humanity in our nation today. At our church we talk a lot about loving the city and this has been just a really rubber meets the road. Do we really do we really believe what we say we believe? When when our faith gets tested and when things get hard, are we really going to come and and uh, in some ways lay our lives down to serve the people that live here and to serve the the city itself? We're not professionals, we just live here and uh, we've just seen this incredible thing that it just feels like God has built around us because we just showed up and said we want to serve our city and we want to serve families. It's been really special to have organizations like the Red Cross and FEMA and AmeriCorps come in and say, hey, we, we heard you guys are leading the charge. How do we come alongside you and help you? Who are you guys? And we just get to say, we're just a collection of local churches. We live here, this is our city and we love it and we're here to serve it.